G'day guys, I'm Matt Brand. Wait, hang on, that's not right. Let's try that again, shall we? G'day guys, I'm Matt Brand and I'm gonna launch the all new 2021 Kia Carnival. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I am test driving the all new 2021 Kia Carnival. And in all seriousness, it has me questioning all of my loyalties. You guys know me. You know that I think unless you have three or more spawn, you really don't need an SUV in 90% of situations. However, it's just me and my girlfriend, not here right now, invisible, okay? I admit it, I admit it. And I want this thing ASAP in my garage because honestly, it is just incredible. Not without its flaws but it's incredible. So let's just get straight into the review. The Kia Carnival starts with the S-Grade and that comes as standard with a V6 engine. It is a petrol engine and it's pretty good, but best of all is that it starts at just under 51,000 Australian dollars drive away, which is a lot of car for the money. The car I'm driving here today is the top spec Platinum Diesel. The Platinum starts at just over 68,000 Australian dollars for the V6 version. And this one here that I'm driving today starts at just over 70,000 Australian dollars driveway. While the V6 is technically a newer engine and it is petrol, it's quite a lot of fun. It is still a petrol engine. The diesel four-cylinder turbocharged unit is just, it's just a more refined engine. It's certainly substantially more fuel efficient too. And it suits the character of this car. By the way, if my voice sounds a bit weird today, it's not COVID, don't worry. Had it checked out. It's a cold, very annoying. Let's just get back to the review. So if you're buying the Kia Carnival, go for the four cylinder. The V6 is admittedly a little bit more fun because you can rev it higher. It has quite a lot of power to it. Except if you're looking for fun in a minivan, you probably need to think about your priorities. Anyway, in terms of power, the V6 has 216 kilowatt of power and 355 newton meters of torque. While this turbo diesel engine is also surprisingly powerful, 148 kilowatt of power and 440 newton meters of torque. Now, the reason I find that so funny is because this car is front wheel drive only. So you effectively have hot hatch power going directly to the front wheels, regardless of which engine you choose. Excuse me here while I give it some sauce. <laughs> oh man. Now, because you have hot hatch levels of power going through to an open diff, no matter what conditions are, when you're stopped and you put your foot down, the car, it just spins up the front wheels. Now, no one's doing that in a minivan. I just think it's quite funny that, you know, you've got all that power going to the front wheels. And you might be wondering, well, why isn't there an all wheel drive version? Especially considering this is on the exact same platform as the Kia Sorento that I reviewed, and you should definitely watch that review after this. And the reason is because once you put an all wheel drive system and you have to have the transmission tunnel going through to the back, etc., etc., it creates a lot of infrastructure underneath the car that eats up into space within the car. And being a minivan, you want as much space as possible. So it's front wheel drive only. Now for both engines, power is sent through a really good eight speed torque converter automatic transmission. Now that is not the latest eight speed dual clutch that you get, for example, in the Kia Sorento again, but it is still really, really good. It's a great pairing for this car because shifts are seamless upshifts and downshifts. You just do not feel them. It is such a smooth and comfortable transmission to have. And in a lot of instances, especially when you take off things like that, it is better than a dual clutch because dual clutches have that kind of throw you back and forward mentality when they're changing between gears. You don't get that in a torque converter. So it's a really nice ride. And it's actually quite interesting. The reason that this doesn't come with a dual clutch is in the US, they prefer a torque converter. And the Carnival's biggest market, or one of its biggest markets anyway, is the US, North America. So it misses out on the more modern dual clutch, but it's still very good. And of course, being a minivan, you wanna know how fast it is in a straight line. So let's do launch control. The zero to 100 or zero to 62 miles an hour is <laughs> oh, 
Oh, it's not very quick. It's around about 10 seconds. I'm at 80. I'm just going to stop here. Never thought I could lose a license in a minivan, but uh, I, I might prove everyone wrong. Anyway, we'll get back to how it drives because there are some flaws. But for now, I want to talk about the way it looks. Genuinely, this is the best people mover ever made. Hands down, it's not even a competition. This looks more like an SUV or a GUV, a grand utility vehicle, as Kia Marketing would like you to think it is. Uh, but it looks more like an SUV than a minivan. The front has this stunning cascading grille that's finished in like these individual chrome pieces. And speaking of chrome, there is plenty of chrome dotted around the entire interior. The headlights, they have a lot going on. It really confused me at first. But the way it works is on the inside within the grille are the high beams where you would normally see a low beam light. You get the low beams, that's good. The daytime running lights, they look incredible but they're huge, which I like. I like that a lot. And they also house the turning signal indicators. So there's a lot of like different placements of lights, but they all work. Again, it's just totally stunning from the front. It looks so, just so cool. A minivan, a minivan looks cool. Excuse me here while I give it some of that juicy, juicy sauce. 80 kilometers an hour, we got there. Also, you will be getting the new Kia badge on these, but because this is an earlier press unit, it doesn't have that, which is a shame because it looks pretty cool. Actually, what do you think of the new Kia badge? I'd like to know. The side, yeah, it's a 100% minivan, but it is still annoyingly cool. Now, while the new Kia Carnival is just as long as the previous Kia Carnival, it is actually 30 millimeters longer in the wheelbase, and that means you get extra room on the inside. It's also just a little bit wider and a little bit taller than the outgoing Carnival. The first thing that you notice about the side is like the facade that they put on the C pillar. It's this like beautiful art piece. It's like this diamond pattern really beautiful and it makes it look a lot more expensive than it actually is. The Platinum that I'm driving here today is sat on these 19 inch blacked out alloy wheels and to be honest there's something a little bit cheap about them. I don't know if they're because they're quite thin, they don't have much depth to them but there's just something about them that I don't like. I mean, they're cool for a minivan and all, but I mean, Kia make much better wheels. Otherwise, it's a really neat design. You have like floating roof rails up top. And by the way, the Kia Platinum does get automated sliding doors. And actually, let's talk about the key for a second because you can control a lot of the car from the key. The key is a big, thick, fat, chonky boy. It feels good in the head. I feel like there's 101 ways to open these doors. So let's see if I can remember all of them. First of all, you can open any of the automatic doors, which is the sliding doors and the tail gate from the key. Hold the button down, you can open the left hand side and of course the right hand side and of course the tailgate. And then you can close them again from the exact same button. Then if you hold the unlock button for three seconds, it will open the three doors, the two sliding doors, the tailgate, they will open. Again, same deal, press the lock button and they will all close together too. People keep staring at me. Especially mums, <laughs> they love this car. But it's so handy if you need to pack the whole family in the car, you're going on a road trip, it's so easy just to open up all the doors. But wait, there's more. It is a proximity sensing key. So if you have the key in your pocket or in your hands, wherever, and you walk up to one of the doors and you wait there, the car will beep three times and then it will automatically open whichever door. And then when you walk away, it will close the door and lock the car too. It is just incredible and so handy. And I haven't even mentioned how to open the sliding doors on the inside. There's two ways. You can either press a button that's on the B pillar or your kids can. And by the way, you could lock that all out through a little system right where the driver's leg is. Or you can open it from that same area too. So I guess there's three ways. Or you can pull the door handle and that will automatically open the doors as well. There's like a thousand ways to open the doors. I think I've remembered all of them. But it's just truly impressive. But anyway, let's talk about one of my favorite design elements of this car. That's the entire rear, especially the light bar. It is just stunning. It's got like this minimalist yet modern design to it. There's not too much going on back there there, which is exactly what you want, but the way that they've done it, honestly, it's perfection. And there's really not much else to talk about, but I want to know from you guys, do you think they have nailed the design? I've left my thoughts down in the comment section below, so go check that out and let me know what you think. Now I want to move on to the interior of the carnival because there's a lot to cover and a couple of things to complain about, but before we do, please do go down there and hit the subscribe button and that notification bell so you can see as soon as I release minivan reviews like this. Also while you're down there, please do hit the like button, it really, really helps the channel out. Thank you. Excuse me here while I give it some sauce. <laughs>
So what about the interior? Well, I want to start with what's not great. Now, I went to the launch of the Kia Carnival and in that they said that the Kia Carnival would be missing out on some key aspects that you get in the left-hand drive markets, which they put down to COVID delays, which I can kind of see, but you'll see why some I can't. The biggest thing that you miss out on compared to left-hand drive markets is this gets analog gauges. In the top spec elsewhere in left-hand drive markets, they get the 12.3 inch digital gauges you see in the Kia Sorento, which are absolutely fantastic. Whereas these gauges are literally straight out of a Kia Picanto. No joke, that screen in the center, 4.2 inches, it's literally the exact same screen that I've driven in that $15,000 Kia Picanto. Love that car, watch that review too. But you know, this is a $70,000 car. So that will be coming in 2022 when they can engineer it for right-hand drive markets. That I can kind of get. They might need to change some tooling, things like that. What I don't understand is why this doesn't come with automatic wipers, why that couldn't be done. I have no idea how COVID could have messed with that. It doesn't get it. I don't, I, don't, I don't agree that there are COVID delays, or at least I would like to know what they are. What do you guys think? Do we have any engineers? Could, is that really that hard to do for left versus right-hand drive markets? I would have thought everything would have been the same. Honestly, these two things alone would make me wait for the 2022 version, but you know. I seriously, though, have nothing else to fault about the interior. I'm gonna race this B-Class off the line. It's not even a competition. I win hands down every time. First of all, soft touch materials are just absolutely everywhere. And dare I say, it is a beautiful looking place to be. You have like wooden design elements up on the dash. You've got these really cool like 3D effect inserts in the doors, especially at night do they look awesome. And then you have like nice touches. For example, in this Platinum, you get this like merled gear selector down here with this nice glass feel up top. Super premium. Is it totally unnecessary? Yes, but do I like it? Yeah. And it's just a really beautiful place to be in a minivan. Even the way this dash design is, and yes, it would look a lot better with the digital gauges, but this is like a single, almost like continuous screen effect to it. It's just, it's cool. You also get dual sunroofs in this platinum model, which are really nice. Oh look, it's the old Kia Carnival. In terms of ergonomics and practicality, you guessed it, the Kia Carnival just destroys. The steering wheel is tilting and telescoping, of course. The seats are adjusting in about trillion ways with great lumbar support too. You've got two cup holders in the center, two more in the doors, and the door bins are just huge. The center armrest is like its own postcode, massive. In front of it is a little storage area too. Then you've got like a little cutout up front where you can store your phone. There's a wireless charger there. You've got three USB ports up there too. And the glove box is a massive side with more storage on the left hand side of the center tunnel just so much storage oh and in the cup holders is like a phone holding thing which is cool i guess you can have multiple phone storage options up front they really know their customer in 2021 now these seats while they're not the most beautiful seats in the world they are extremely comfortable they're not like a sport seat that try and squeeze you to death they're more like a lounge chair which is exactly what you want you really do feel like you're sitting in like a lazy boy it's just it's very comfortable they are synthetic leather you're not going to get real leather in a minivan because again kia knows their customers they get dirty pretty easily, these seats, when you have kids, synthetic leather, you can wipe off. But the seats are heated and cooled, and honestly, they would fool you to be real leather. Now this steering wheel, like every Kia steering wheel, fantastic. It feels great in their hands. It's not too thick either. It's not like a sports car again. You get these really surprisingly nice paddle shifters, which are cool to the touch. Honestly, they could be metal. I don't know, it could fool me. Excuse me here while I give it some sauce. Come on, 80. We got to the speed limit, ladies and gents. It's not a race car. But anyway, the steering wheel is nice leather. Best part of it though, is just its functionality. You have buttons here to control absolutely everything. Big shout out to the lane centering assist. A lot of motoring journalists just have this like hate for lane centering because it takes away from the driving experience. But when you're on a highway and it's driving itself, it makes a difference. So up your bum with a rubber thumb. Now we could talk about the instrument cluster, but I almost don't want to, purely because it's going to be replaced. And while this is pretty good, I mean, it's good enough, you know, it, it's, it's kind of not good enough. On the left-hand side is a nice big bright tachometer, easy to read. On the right-hand side is a nice big bright 
speedometer. Again, easy to read. In the center, you have the Kia Picanto display where you can you know, cycle through a few different menus and see a few different things like your speed, but it's just, it's just nowhere near as good as the digital gauges. I won't harp on about it, but I'm disappointed. What I'm not disappointed about though is this just absolutely enormous infotainment system. I forget now off the top of my head how big it is. I think it's 12 and a half inches. I'll correct myself if I'm wrong, but it is honestly, it's like the best infotainment screen out there purely because it is just so damn functional. It is super responsive to the touch. It's truly pixel dense, color accurate as all hell and a great refresh rate too. So it's not laggy. Of course you have navigation, digital radio, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. It's not wireless Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, which you can get on lower spec models because uh, Hyundai is having like an argument with Google and Apple or something. But honestly, I prefer wired systems anyway, because for example, I'm in the M3 as well this week, but I'm having so many issues all the time with wireless connectivity, it's doing my head in. And if something goes wrong with wired, you just pull out the plug, put it back in, and it usually fixes itself. I wanna talk about a couple of the really cool features that you get because it's a minivan. First of all, you get what's called passenger talk, where it uses microphones in the front to amplify it in the back. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's pretty cool. It means like when you have AIDS in your throat right now, like me, you don't have to scream. And the other one is quiet mode where it will dim the speakers at the front. That's not correct. It will turn off the speakers in the back, which by the way, this is a Bose sound system. Honestly, it just sounds absolutely incredible. But yeah, it turns it off so your kids can sleep and you can listen to music. Just really smart, family oriented features like that. Now. Of course, this is a minivan. You want to know about the rear seats. And it's probably the only video where you actually will want to know about the rear seats. So at five foot 11, I have plenty of leg room, plenty of headroom, and plenty of toe room. It is just a supremely comfortable place to be. Each seat back there moves individually, as in slides back and forth forward, you can also recline them individually. And the middle seat, you can turn that into an armrest and cup holders with a little storage area. You can slide it back as well if you really want to, or you can remove it entirely and keep captain's chairs back there. Now, while you can technically flip around that seat so it's facing backwards, you can't do that legally in Australia. So it can do it, but it's not legal. You've also got armrests on the side of the seats. The outboard seats are heated and you get privacy shades back there or peasant blockers so no one can see your little children. Of course, you also get a third climate control zone back there, which is individually controlled and you have little air vents up in the roof for both the second row and the third row. And then speaking of third row, of course there's a third row. You've got three seats back there because yeah, this is an eight seater and you get a couple of USB ports back there. You know, you get your cup holders too. But honestly, most impressive to me is how the seats back there go up and down. It's like a one-handed motion. It uses hydraulics to assist you. I love it. And you also get little peasant blockers in the third row too, which is kind of cute. But at five foot 11, again, plenty of leg room. Toe room is actually pretty good too. And headroom is all right. You can get seven adults into this car absolutely perfectly fine. Eight might be a squeeze, but seven will do. And then most impressive of all, and why people actually buy minivans is just how much storage you get in the boot. With all three rows up, you get 627 liters, which might not sound like an amazing stat, but let me tell you, you can fit, you can stack like three full-size suitcases back there, it's that good. With ease and with room to spare. And then if you wanna put down the third row, you get like 2,700 liters of boot space, which is something just totally stupid. And then of course you can remove the middle seat and push the other two seats forward and God, I don't even know. It's like you have an infinity amount of space. It is just so practical. Back to how it drives though, and, and this is where there's another issue. You see, while Australia does get its own bespoke suspension and handling tune, the steering tune is a global tune straight from Korea. And what that means is that you get this incredibly light steering. I mean, there's so much, like I, I'm turning the st steering wheel so much right now. And it's just like, Happy to go in a straight line. I've just never met steering that's so unapologetically light. And light steering is important in a minivan. It really is. And by the way, this has a 12.7 meter turning circle as I'm trying to do it, which is it's pretty good for a, uh, a minivan. But it's just so light. And I can hear the electricals when I turn the steering wheel. It's 
It's odd. It's just, it's far too light. It's far too light. It's all right. It's just, you know, it's far too light. Now again, Kia blamed that on COVID because the Australia team that does all the Kia, Hyundai, and Genesis tuning, they weren't able to do that. And that makes sense. They do that a lot in Melbourne and Melbourne the has been one of the most locked down places in the world, I know, because I live there. But it is, it is a crying shame. Again, like that alone would make me want to wait. I don't know if it'll be hugely different, but it probably will be. Now, you can change it between driving modes. If you put it into sport, it noticeably stiffens up and becomes quite heavy. So I found myself driving in sport mode a lot because it just feels a lot more closer to like the Kia Sorento. Yeah, it's just, it's a bit of a shame. But that's my only complaint in how it drives. And that's a pretty good thing. Simply put, it is just so smooth at any speed. Whether you're highway driving or driving around the burbs as I am today, it's just so comfortable and so relaxed. And they've also done a really good job in sound deadening. It's surprisingly quiet in here. Acoustics genuinely are, are class leading. You've actually got a very similar damper and suspension setup to the Kia Sorento. Again, it's the Australian tune. And that just means that this is honestly the best handling minivan I have ever driven and that you will ever drive and that might ever exist. It's just, it's, it's that good. And during the launch, you know, I got to speak to the Australian designers who worked on the suspension and they were so switched on and it's just, they're just so impressive and their work really tells that. You know, going over bumps like I did right now, you don't feel it. Of course, the car is not fully laden right now, but it doesn't matter. Even when there's a lot of weight within here, it just handles everything so well. Fuel economy has been really, really surprising. I've been doing mainly urban driving and I've been getting about nine liters per 100 kilometers, which is really good for a car of this size. In the V6, expect to be getting 11, 12 liters at least, especially if you're lead footed like me. Excuse me here while I give it one last uh, sore send. Yeah, it's not, it's not gonna break any uh, any speed records, but it's pretty good. And actually, while I'm at highway cruising speeds, I just wanna show you again how comfortable it is. It just wafts along the road. This would be the perfect car to drive Melbourne to Sydney in. It's just that good, truly, it's just that good. So is the Kia Carnival worth it? Yeah, honestly, it's the best minivan for families that you can buy right now. If you wanna get into a minivan, you just want a car that's extremely practical, you need all that space, or you're like me, and you just, you're just in awe of how practical it is, then for the price, the seven year warranty, and the inclusions, uh, the styling, everything, I just, you, you can't go past it. I really, really like it. But what do you guys think of the Kia Carnival? Do you think it's a great car? Do you hate minivans? Let me know. Also, while you're down there, please do subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell. Like the video, of course, please. It does absolutely help the channel out. And uh, I'll see you next week, hopefully without this.